you heard a theme in our songs this morning, uh, thinking about the rock of Jesus Christ, right? Um, a cleft for us when we approach the judgment throne, uh, a solid foundation for us, and um, it is a joy to be back with you guys, uh, to worship Jesus Christ with you. Uh, we, uh, I'm really looking forward to the Lord's Supper today, because um, one of the things that uh, a lot of the churches we visited over the summer, one thing that was often lacking from the services was the celebration of the Lord's Supper, and so um, I'm just overjoyed to be able to partake of that with you this morning. You can open up your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew. We're going to be all over Scripture today, um, uh, but, and I have some, I think, to, did we get those slides working, Joel? There it is, okay. So I have some slides, they'll have the scripture on there, so you don't have to, like, necessarily turn to every single text, um, but I wanted to, uh, we're going to be exploring something this morning. The, the title of the sermon is Unshakable, and uh, I, have, I have a natural, uh, built-in way to establish how shakable something is. How many of you guys are leg shakers when you're sitting? Leg shakers? We've got some leg shakers out there. That's right. Can't sit still, right? If you're sitting down, your leg's going to, you know? That, that's, I, I, have this, I have this thing. So back in the day when we had church pews, if you wanted to stay awake, just sit on the same church pew with me, right? Because I would, I would shake it the whole service long. Um, I, uh, I used to shake my leg in the van, and my dad would think something was wrong with the vehicle because the whole vehicle is going like this as we're driving down the road. And he's like, what is going on? I'm like, my bad. That was me. I uh, didn't realize it, you know. And uh, I, we had a glass cabinet in our dining room growing up. And, and our, our, it was kind of like an older house. It didn't really have a great floor. And so anytime I would shake my leg at the dinner table, you'd start to notice it because the whole glass cabinet would start going, shh. And everyone would be like, Ben! And I'm like, my bad. Sorry. Um, I'm sure you've had someone like that in your family. You're identifying with that story. If not, um, then I'm sorry. It's, 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 uh, I, li I don't try. It's not, it just comes natural. But the question that I want to explore this morning, uh, other than living down memory lane with me and my leg shaking, is the question, this question. Is it possible? Wait, were we supposed to dismiss something, Jessica? <laughs> You're patiently standing in the back. All the kids are like, do we have to listen to you? You guys want to go upstairs? But you could, okay, all right, I won't take it personally. All right, you guys could, uh, gospel warriors, you can be dismissed upstairs to your class. Man, no one was waving me down. Everyone was just letting me get into the sermon here. <laughs> all right. So the question that we're going to explore this morning as we go through scripture. Is it possible to live an unshakable Christian life? Is it possible to live an unshakable Christian life? And what would it mean to be unshakable? What would that mean? To be immovable, to be strong. Because I have no doubt that everyone in this room has felt shaken. Right? It's a little crazy to think about all the things that can go wrong with life. You have all sorts of family history, marriage, parenting, work, aging parents, death of loved ones, political upheaval, upheaval physical pain, car failures, house destruction. These are heavy, difficult realities that often will leave us feeling unstable and insecure. You, you have probably, if you've lived past the age of five, you have experienced deeply troublesome realities. You have been shaken by life. When Georgia loses this year, some of you are going to have a really hard time with it. But when I'm using this word unshakable, I'm not suggesting that we should be closed off to the emotional and physical pain that we experience. 
I'm not suggesting some type of name it and claim it theology where we just have to say, no pain, no, in the name of Jesus, go away, pain, no pain. That, that's not what I'm talking about in living unshakable. Suffering, trials, the things that shake us in life are really, really hard. And they are designed by God for our good. So there must be a way that we can be and feel unshaken even when our circumstances make it seem like the world is falling apart. Must be a way. We're going to explore a biblical metaphor to help us process this this morning. We're going to go quickly through some scripture, and then I want to consider, meditate on it, encourage you with this word this morning. These verses don't necessarily say the same thing in the same way, uh, but they all hit a consistent point, and so that's what we're going to dig into this morning. All right, so you turn to Matthew, uh, go specifically to Matthew chapter 7. Here's the outline this morning. We're going to look at a couple houses, then we're going to look at the rock, then we're going to look at the church house, then the temple house, then the spiritual house, and then the future city. It's going to be quite the journey this morning, okay? So we're going to try to hit all these things in a, in a very short time. First of all, in Matthew chapter 7, we're going to go to the end of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount to a familiar parable. You'll recognize it as we read, probably. If you, if you grew up in church, you'll recognize it. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. The reason why I say you'll recognize the song is because, or the, the, the story is because of the song, right? There's a, there's a children's song that we learned growing up. Uh, the wise man built his house upon a rock. Or maybe you didn't heard that one, but anyway, I, I did. And I love kids' songs. I love kids' songs about the stories of scripture. However, what I don't love is always sticking Bible stories into kids' songs. Uh, because then they tend to, as you grow up, they, they tend to be stripped of their intensity, right? Like Joshua fought the battle of Jericho and the walls came tumbling down, right? That's a really intense story. That, that, that's pretty weighty stuff if you actually think about what's really going on as Israel's coming in to take the land of Canaan. Sometimes the kids' songs can make us lessen it or, or like let it shine. Don't let Satan it out. I'm going to let it shine, right? Like that's a, I get it, but it's kind of putting Satan as if he's simply some kind of like wolf in a three little pigs fairy tale. Like, like look out for Satan, guys. He might blow your light out. Like, no, no, Satan's, his, the way he is an enemy against us is a little more intense than his lung power. Or Zacchaeus was a wee little man, right? And he met Jesus, and we sing about that. That's great. But the point of that story, it's about massive generosity and probably a complete loss of social status for Zacchaeus. So in this text, we don't want to take away the intensity of it because you might have sung it growing up in a, in a children's song. To not listen to Jesus and obey Jesus is to build your house on sand. You will be shakable, and you will fall, and the Bible even emphasizes, and great will be your fall. If you're not listening to Jesus and walking with Jesus, then your house is on sand, and it will crumble. But to listen to Jesus and to obey Jesus is to build your house on the rock. And the winds can blow, and the floods can come, but the house on the rock will not fall, it will remain secure, and it will prove to be unshakable. Flip over to Matthew chapter 16. 
verse 13. It says, Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven... And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. Now, I would love to explain this text in its context like we typically do here with expositional preaching, but again, I'm just trying to follow a metaphor here that's continuing through these teachings of the New Testament and actually carrying on from the old. What is the rock on which Christ will build his church? A rock seems pretty unshakable, right? It, that's the whole point of the metaphor. It's, it's strong, it's secure, it's stable, it's immovable. So what is the rock? And the answer is very clear. It's Peter. Thank you, Billy. To which I know you're all saying, Ben, don't tell us you converted to Catholicism on your sabbatical. No, I did not. It's okay. You can all breathe again. All right. Whew. I'm a Protestant Re Reformation guy through and through, okay? But, but, we do have to explain these verses exegetically and not just accepting things that we just have heard right? Um, Jesus is using a word play here in the, in, the, in, the, in the Greek. He says, you are Peter, which is Petros, and on this rock, Petra, I will build my church, right? There's this word play. Is he's talking to Peter, and he's referring to Peter as this rock on which he's going to build his church. What is he saying by that? Now, clearly, it's not just Peter. It's the Peter who confesses that Jesus Christ is the son of, man, the, son of the living God. The confession is the rock. It's okay. Don't be, don't be nervous. But I want us to not miss the point that Jesus is making and that will continue to be made through the New Testament. The, the, the rock is Peter making this confession. And the church, historically, is going to be built on Peter as the first proclaimer of the messianic truth about Jesus. Peter is going to be the initial bearer of the testimony about Jesus as the church's beginning foundations are laid. If you go to the book of Acts, Acts 2, who's proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of the kingdom to the Jews in Acts 2? It's Peter. Who's taking it to Samaria in, in Acts 8? It's Peter. Who's going to the Gentiles in Acts 10? It's Peter because he's the initial witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ from Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth. And on that foundation, Christ is going to build his church. Christ has built his church, is building his church, and the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. Peter is not some figurehead that must continue to be present through apostolic succession. That would be an error. But he is a representative disciple who will be the first apostle to historically play out how Christ will build his church, which is through the proclamation of the truth about who he is and what he has done, namely the gospel of Jesus Christ. So then let's continue to follow this through the story of scripture. But before we keep going, notice how unshakable the metaphor is here. The rock Peter, as witness to Christ's messianic status, is a beginning foundation for the church. <laughs> and the gates of hell can't stop this. I mean, this is powerful. This is strong. Death and the devil are no match for the church that will be built on a solid foundation. So then let's go to 
1 Corinthians chapter 3. Because Paul picks up the metaphor. As he's writing to the church of Corinth, he's planting churches as he's going out with this message about Jesus Christ. And this just goes to show that it doesn't all have to be Peter. He's just the, he's just the first one. But Paul now has taken this call. He's become an apostle by, and through Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle by the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the Corinthians are a, are a rough bunch. They're experiencing a lot of division. And the church leaders are uh, with the, uh, a division over the church leaders and the apostles. All in all, the church, if you read Corinth, the church feels very shaky. <laughs> Like, as you read through Paul's letter to the Corinthians, you're thinking, is this church going to make it? How is this church holding together? I mean, they're fighting over their leaders. They are involved. There's immorality in the church that's not being dealt with. They're disrupting their services by taking the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. They're doing all sorts of things that is shaky stuff. It's, it's not the strength of Christ being worked out in the community of faith. And Paul's like, guys... Let's not forget our beginnings, our foundation. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10. Paul refers back to his, what he was doing when he planted the church. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation. And someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the foundation on which Paul built the church. If you go back to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, he says, I desired to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. How did Paul plant churches? He went proclaiming the message of Jesus Christ's crucifixion because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. The foundation is Jesus Christ. And as Paul moves along in his ministry, this metaphor of the foundation is going to continue. But he writes to the, he writes to the Ephesians seven years later. A.D. 62, about. So when he writes to the Ephesians, it's about seven years after he wrote a letter to the Corinthians. And I think, I'm not sure if Paul's like working out his theological metaphor here, or if he just tends, he goes with a, he goes with a different way because he's emphasizing some different allusions to some Old Testament scripture. But turn to Ephesians. Let's, let's, keep, let's stay with Paul for a second. Turn to Ephesians. Chapter 2. Ephesians 2, 19 through 22. He says this, Ephesians 2, 19. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. In whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So Paul, Paul's point here with the metaphor is, okay, so Jesus, he comes along, he's saying, look, listen to me, obey me, you're building your house on a solid rock. And then we find out that Peter, the one who's confessing this truth about Jesus as the Son of God, the Messiah, that's going to be how it all starts. And then on that confession, Peter's going to proclaim to all the earth, Jews, Samaritans, and the Gentiles, that Jesus Christ is that foundation. We see Paul playing this out as he plants churches. The foundation is Jesus Christ. And now, guys, listen up. You're not, your church, as a church, you are God's building. And as a church, and dwelt by the Spirit, that building that you are is a temple. This is a temple house, and you are built on a solid foundation, the one that the apostles and the prophets laid, and Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of the whole building. 
Jesus Christ is the unshakable cornerstone that everything is aligned to. And this means that we will now be a building, a temple, where the power and the, the power of the Spirit of God dwells. So, so we see that to be a part of this grounded and unshakable church community that not even the gates of hell can prevail against is to be a member of God's house with a strong foundation of apostolic prophetic witness, the cornerstone being none other than Jesus Christ, the Messiah. This is the house built on the rock. The church is the house of God, which makes it a temple. We're the people of the church. So we stand and we live and we move and we dance and we die founded on the cornerstone of Jesus Christ. Now, don't get confused by the metaphor. It can throw us off a little bit. Because you're thinking, wait, so I'm a rock? I'm a, I'm a stone in, the, in a building? The apostles are the foundation, Jesus the cornerstone. Doesn't that all seem a bit dead? Right? A bit stagnant? Just to be a stone in a building? Like, it's a weird metaphor. Right? How do I, how do I, how do I, how do I live that out when I'm, when I'm just a stone? Right? Well, let's go back to Peter. He'll help us out. One more. Peter, here, help us out. Keep going. First Peter. First Peter chapter 2. Verse 4. As you come to him, a living stone. <laughs> you didn't know there were living stones, did you? <laughs> This, this metaphor is living, right? As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable through God to God through Jesus Christ. And I could continue to go through that and bring in the Old Testament. But I was doing so much this morning, I decided to just let you go back and explore all the Old Testament imagery that's really rooted in, that all this is rooted from. But notice what Peter is saying. Jesus is the living stone who was rejected by men at the cross. In the sight of God, he is chosen and precious and he's living because he rose from the grave. Right? He, he didn't remain dead. Jesus rose again. And so he's the living stone. His death and resurrection becomes the cornerstone reality that everything in the Old Testament pointed to and everything that has come after has been built upon. The apostles and prophets proclaimed the good news of the kingdom and continued the foundation laying all aligned to the cornerstone that is Jesus Christ. And then Peter says about us, we now are living stones, a part of God's house, God's temple. We're a part of the temple of God. And that means that in this house of, as living stones, we offer our lives as worship to God. Every part of our life, corporately and personally, is a spiritual sacrifice because we are living every single day as temples of the Holy Spirit and as the temple of God as his church. You are a temple and the church is a temple. And so every moment of every day of every year of your entire lifetime is now a whole offering, a spiritual sacrifice to God who now dwells here among us and with us and in us. Listening to Jesus and obeying Jesus, the life of spiritual sacrifice is building your house on the rock. It's building your house on the cornerstone. And that makes us unshakable. It makes us unshakable. And we're going to talk about that, but I just got one more text. Revelation 21. Because this isn't just the reality of 
what happened in the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not just who we are in Jesus Christ now and by his spirit. There is a hope here. There's the hope of the gospel in this metaphor as well, as we see here in Scripture. So Revelation 21, we're getting to the last chapters of the Bible. Let's read what it says. I think I'm actually going to start a little sooner than I have it in my notes. Yep, I'm going to start in verse 9. All right. Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. Who's the bride, the wife of the Lamb? It's the church. It's us. Another metaphor. Yeah, but we're mixing them up today. Okay. So the bride is the wife of the Lamb. What's the Lamb refer to? Jesus, but Jesus crucified, right? Like there's a lot of theology in the reference to Jesus as the lamb because he was the lamb who died and was offered as a substitute and sacrifice in our place. So we are who we are because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And it's right here as he calls us the wife of the lamb. Remember, everything comes back to Jesus Christ and him crucified. Everything comes back to the cornerstone that was rejected by men. Everything is tied to the cross of Jesus Christ. And he carried me away to the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city. He's going to show him the wife of the lamb and he shows him a city. Can't get away from the architectural metaphor. He, the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God and its radiance like a most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates and at the gates, 12 angels. And on the gates of the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. There's the Old Testament. And on the east, three gates on the north three gates, and on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. Here's the verse I want to point out here. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations. And on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So, in, same metaphor, right? In the new city, in the new Jerusalem, the foundation is the apostles and prophets, or the foundation in the gates of the apostles and the prophets, and the cornerstone, the rock, is Jesus Christ, because they're the foundations of the apostles of the Lamb. Same thing that Paul's talking about in Ephesians chapter 2, where the apostles laid the foundation tied to the cornerstone of Jesus Christ. This is an unshakable foundation, because it's all aligned to the rock. To Jesus Christ, the cornerstone, the living stone, the one rejected by men, the one who died for us, and the one who rose again. So my question, again, from the beginning, what does it mean to live an unshakable life? Can you live an unshakable life as a follower of Jesus Christ? And the answer is yes. Yes, you can. It, it's wholly possible. You have to know, as a follower of Jesus, on whom you stand, in whom you stand, right? In the grace in which you stand, like we read in Romans 5. You have to know the rock on whom you stand. And this means that everything has to be aligned in your life to the cornerstone. Everything. Not a single centimeter of your life untouched because one centimeter off can lead to a shaky foundation. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the stability for all that exists. It is the reality by which everything is tested. It is the paradigm through everything in which everything should be understood. It is the security for our lives in a broken and fallen world. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, is that central reality that we align every part of our existence to. And whenever we start to feel shaken, we make a sprint towards the cross of Jesus Christ. Because that's the only unshakable place. 
So Christian, are you feeling shaken? Does life have you discouraged, angry, indifferent, tired, confused, hopeless, despairing? Does, does life have you feeling shaken? I want to just encourage your faint-heartedness this morning. Remember on whom you stand. Remember who you have. Be renewed as you consider the strength and the promises and the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not implying, please don't hear me wrong, I'm not implying that you're not going to feel shaken. <laughs> right? After all, suffering and trial are guaranteed in this present age. Right? Right? Like, this is not some, like, we get to just live a nice, cozy, cushy life because Jesus is our security, and so we don't ever have to feel insecure. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that in those times of need, in those times of pain, in those times of hardship, be vigilant in remembering the truth in remembering who Jesus is and take those feelings and take that sense of being shaken to the foot of the cross of Jesus Christ because you will find comfort there. You will find rest there. You will find strength there because that is unshakable. And so any amount of unshakableness in us is because we are hugging the cross in which we know Jesus Christ is no longer dead but risen. You've got to run to the unshakable cornerstone that was rejected by men. John Piper has this great quote. He says, you may be going through things right now that are painfully preparing you for some precious service to Jesus and to his people. When a person strikes rock bottom with a sense of nothingness and helplessness, he may find that he has struck the rock of ages. When you feel like you've struck rock bottom, <laughs> do you know what your foundation is? If you get all the way down to the, to the dregs, your foundation is the cornerstone. You're good. <laughs> He's got you. He can support you. He can secure you. But you've got to find that he's the one who makes it unshakable. And that doesn't take away the sense and the feelings of shakiness and the experiences of shakiness that we will find. I mean, consider the stories of the saints. Corey Ten Boom, in a Nazi concentration camp, afterward proclaiming a message of forgiveness and grace and healing, she was shaken. And yet, unshakable. Jim and Elizabeth Elliot, missionaries in Ecuador, who lost, they were shaken, Jim lost his life. And yet then Elizabeth Elliot goes back to the same people who killed her husband with the gospel of Jesus Christ. They were shaken and yet unshakable. John Bunyan was imprisoned and taken from his family, which included being taken away from his blind daughter. He was shaken and yet unshakable. Johnny Erickson Tata, quadriplegic, paralyzed from the shoulders down. And what does she say? I'd rather be in this wheelchair knowing God than on my feet without him. Because there's nothing better, nothing better than knowing the rock, than knowing Jesus Christ, the cornerstone. And I could go on all day with more stories of saints who lived and are living in the unshakable life because their lives are built on the cornerstone. And I'm saying this morning, this is our life. This is what we have in Christ. We have someone to run to who can handle anything that life 
brings our way, he can handle it. He, can't, he doesn't always fix it. Sometimes you die because of it. Or you wind up in a wheelchair or it falls apart and everything that you dreamed about and all of your expectations and all of your hopes don't end up working out the way you thought. That happens in this life, but you are still secure in Christ. So Christian, are you feeling shaken? Be encouraged to run to the cross of Jesus Christ. But I also want to ask this question. Are you feeling shaken? Because maybe, maybe you've ceased to align yourself to the cornerstone. Maybe there's unrepentant sin in your life. Because Jesus said, listen to my words and obey them and you will be built on this rock. Like this isn't just some like passive, I mean Jesus does all the work. We are truly those who do not work. We're justified by faith alone and by grace alone and in Christ alone. We don't do anything to get into this house. And yet we're living stones. And it doesn't make sense when the living stone thinks that he can exist outside of the foundation that's been laid. And so we've got to align ourselves to the cornerstone. And my question is, have you become distracted by earthly mindedness? Have you forgotten that you are a living stone in the temple of God and that your whole life is to be one of spiritual worship to him? Maybe you're feeling shaken by the discipline of the father. Maybe you're feeling disconnected from the cornerstone. Well, then you need to repent. This is what the Christian life, this is how we grow. Repentance and increasing faith. Cease acting like a dead stone when you've been raised to be a living stone connected to the unshakable cornerstone. Know who you are. Know what you have in Christ and know that every part of your life is to be in worship to him. So think about it. When you're confessing your sin on a Sunday morning or maybe in the evening after your day, think about it. Where in my life today did I forget that I was supposed to be offering worship to my Savior? Where did I get distracted by earthly mindedness? This is just sidebar, but like we did a fantasy football draft strategy, d draft yesterday, right? This is like just something fun, hobby, you know, guys getting together, create some community. We like it. Eric's going to lose this year. It's going to be great. But let me just say this at the beginning of the fantasy football year, at the beginning of the college football year, at the beginning of the professional football year. Let me just say this at the beginning. If... You are talking about football in this building more than Jesus Christ, then we are not being the church of Christ. What are we doing? Hey, I, I drove past my neighbor. He's walking his dog yesterday. He's trying to get back to the football game. I said, hey, man, he's a South, he's a South Carolina Gamecocks fan. And, and I talked to him for like a brief moment about football and then I moved on. And I just, and I just, I just wa I drove away and I was just like, what is wrong? Like, why is football always the conversation everywhere with everyone? I mean, maybe you're not a football fan, but let me tell you, if you're not, then, then, then blessings upon you. <laughs> because it is so prevalent that it's the only thing that some people can think about. It's the only thing that people feel comfortable talking about. And that's, that's one thing if it's, if it's the, you know, it's a connect, quick connection, you know, easy, I get it. It's like talking about the weather. But if that's what we're coming to One Savior Church to talk about, if that's, if that's why we're coming, if that's all we have to say to one another, when we're here to encourage one another in the Lord and in Christ, when we're here to celebrate Jesus and what he's done in the gospel, I don't give a rip about a stupid little game. And if you come in here with a frown on your face because your team lost, and that frown stays on your face when you walk through these doors, because we're coming to talk about the gospel in Jesus Christ, then, then 
come straight to me, and I'm going to just speak gospel love into you until that frown turns into a smile. Because that's what we should be as the church, right? We should be those who are able to come in on, on bigger issues than football losses, like, like real suffering that you're facing in your life. And we should be able to come in and say, I'm coming here because I need refreshed by Jesus Christ. Or I'm coming here because there are others in this room who need to be refreshed by Jesus Christ. And so I'm going to come and I'm going to breathe life into my brothers and sisters in Christ because they know Jesus and I know Jesus. And we're going to thrive in our knowing Jesus. That's why we're here. Because that's the only unshakable foundation that we have. And I don't know about you, but every Sunday, you're probably coming into this room with your brothers and sisters in Christ, and the week has probably shaken you in some way. Temptations of sin have probably shaken you. Maybe failures in sin have shaken you. Circumstances have shaken you. Hurts, wounds have shaken you. Losses difficulty and we've got to come here knowing that when we gather together as God's people we're, a, we're, we're coming together for some refreshment in the cornerstone of Jesus Christ are you feeling shaken maybe, maybe you're not sure this morning on what your foundation is based maybe I'm talking this morning and you're thinking I don't know what you're talking about I, I, that sounds great to know Jesus in that way, but I don't think I know him in that way. And so my question is, if you aren't familiar, if you aren't sure about your relationship to this cornerstone, if you're unsure about whether you're on this foundation or not, then I'm going to say, will you please come to Jesus this morning? Will you come to him because he has died for your sins and he has risen from the dead and he is the king of the entire cosmos? You must recognize if you don't know this Jesus, you must recognize that he is, that God is a holy God to be feared. And that God will not allow sin and sinners to go unpunished. You, you and I, terrible sinners by the standard of a holy God. You are not okay. You are not good. You are going to be crushed by this stone. But in his mercy, Jesus came and he died in your place so that your sin and my sin might be punished and taken upon him. So that you and I can be saved from our sins and from his wrath. Jesus died on the cross for us, rose again from the dead. He's conquered our spiritual enemy. He's conquered death. He offers us hope and salvation, but only through Jesus Christ. So here's the, here's the call this morning. If you don't know what your foundation is, and if it's not to the cornerstone of Jesus Christ, trust in Jesus for salvation and, and repent from your sins because it's possible to follow him. He's made a way. Turn from your allegiance to yourself and to this world and surrender to Jesus Christ. I just, I just want to say this morning, if you are unsure about your relationship with Jesus Christ, then please come and talk to me after. I'd love to walk you through all that Jesus Christ has done for you. These next couple weeks, we're going to talk a little bit more about this. I just want to give you these last two points about living an unshakable life. First of all, we need to know and remember who the cornerstone is. Know on whom you stand. Secondly, we need to know on what you stand. Right? The apostles' teaching. The apostles and the prophets. Charlton was talking about the prophets this morning. This word is the teaching of the apostles and the prophets. It is the foundation on which we stand because every part of this word is aligned to the cornerstone of Jesus Christ. It's all about Jesus Christ. So we know on whom we stand and we know on what we stand. It's the teaching of the apostles. So we devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching so that we can live an unshakable life. Charles Spurgeon said, a Bible that's falling apart usually belongs to someone who isn't. And that doesn't mean you're not going to feel like you're falling apart. 
But if you have his word and you know the rock, you're still unshakable. And your feelings can become transformed as they are aligned to the unshakable rock of the cornerstone. Know with whom you stand. You stand with the church of Jesus Christ, and we build up one another on this foundation. So we'll talk about those in future weeks. So what does it look like? Remember and live in light of on whom you stand. Remember and live in light of on what you stand, and remember and live in light of with whom you stand. One another, right? This is an unshakable life. And Jesus is so good. He's so strong. He can handle anything and everything that comes our way. He, and we don't have to fret. We don't have to worry. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to feel insecure. Because Jesus Christ is our unshakable cornerstone. And I hope that has encouraged you this morning. I hope you're feeling strengthened in Christ. Because Christ is a giver of strength. Especially to a bunch of weak people like you and me whose only hope of unshakableness is Jesus Christ. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Would you just consider right now any part of your life that has not been aligned to the cornerstone, any feelings or shakiness in your life that you, in which you need to run to Jesus. You need to run to the rock which is grounded, it's it's strong and it's right there by the cross of Jesus Christ that represents the gospel. He is enough. Would you just pray, consider, please don't move past what the Spirit's doing right now. Please don't just close your eyes and just get distracted and tune out. Please speak to the Spirit. Speak to God right now as He speaks to you. Father, we acknowledge that we need you desperately. And so we run. We run to all that you have done for us in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We run to the rock of Jesus Christ, Lord. Please, by your spirit, enable us to live lives as the holy priesthood that you've called us to be. That our hearts and our lives and our community and fellowship and every part would be offered as a spiritual sacrifice to you. Lord, not just in these songs on Sunday, but in the lives that we live, but it all be in worship to you, Lord, as we continue to run to you and live our lives being built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with the cornerstone being Jesus Christ. God, thank you for your grace upon grace upon grace to us, and it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you stand? We're going to take the Lord's Supper this morning, and we're going to remember that Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. He's the one, he's the cornerstone that was rejected by men. And he died for our sins. And so if you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you've been baptized in his name, then you are welcome to this table and you can participate with us in this as we remember, as we eat his flesh and drink his blood, that every part of our existence is because we are participants in what he has done in the gospel of Jesus Christ. He has paid it all. If you have sin in your life, then this table is for you. Come repentant and come receiving the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. Let us sing. Oh.